Very good. Well, everyone this morning, I thank you very much for literally sharing some of your valuable time, not just with me and one another, but with all the people who are participating in the Run the World event. And what I'm going to do is, I'd like each one of you, we'll start with Veronica to give a brief introduction uh, about your background and where you're at. And then we'll start with some questions about how we're going to be impacting the next generations of the family offices. What are they looking for? What are things that we as family office principals or advisors to family offices have experienced in our own lives? Academics are great, but nothing beats reality and our own personal experiences. What we see, what we've learned from our own families, and what we're instilling to the people who are close to us and in our lives. So with that, Veronica, Shim, in Singapore, we turn it over to you, and good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah, everyone. So, um, yeah, this is Veron. Uh, I founded Envision Wealth Management. Um, this is a Asian multifamily office that focuses on, um, well, not only uh, what we say are holistic bespoke solutions for uh, wealthy family in Asia, but increasingly, uh, I see uh, us. Uh, helping a lot of uh, corporate solutions, business solution, capital market solutions for Asian families. Um, as uh, I think a lot of people might understand that Asian family usually makes that business with uh, family wealth, uh, you know, together. So, so we have to cover all. So, trying to build our platform, um, well, to 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 fit all these requirements. Um, I have been uh, twenty years as a private banker, uh, together with my team. Uh, venture out last year and do the right thing and hopefully this works. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Appreciate that. Kevin, McGowan, if you would be so kind as to share with the audience and us a little bit about your background and some of your experiences of dealing with your own family and the next generations. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Stephen, and to Horasis. Uh, it's an honor to be on uh, my colleagues uh, on this panel. Uh, basically, uh, my background is as an M&A attorney and uh, did a lot of deals. Uh, my biggest client at the time was a small company called Invest Corp. Uh, so I learned quite a bit about the deal-making process. At that time, they were the largest acquisition fund in the world with my dear friend, Savio Tan. Uh, and I converted over to doing deals in a small town called Greenwich, Connecticut, which is a very high net worth uh, place, probably the highest in the United States. So we started doing deals and started syndicating them, and uh, they worked out very, very well. Uh, we, we've now been part of the lead uh, group, founding group, of about seven or eight world category leaders, uh, the first of which was the famous Sobe Beverages, uh, which created the nutraceutical uh, category. We're now a single family office, and I have certain of my family involved, and we really, our mantra is catch the current, make the wave. And so we're involved in a lot of what we call do good projects that we monetize to build value, not just value for us. That's, that's actually secondary to us now. It's build value for our people, people who work with us, the communities, and for Mother Earth. So we're considerably involved in things with global impact, particularly in areas that we'll talk about later as to what's happening, but health, wellness, infrastructure, uh, cybersecurity, uh, and the whole gamut, as well as entertainment and sports, uh, because we think that's the next wave to occur. But we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm really pleased to be here. And what we like to do is people say, uh, what do you do? And I said, I'm, I'm a uh, disciple of one of the great philosophers of the 20th century. And they say, God, who is that? And I say, uh, Wayne Gretzky, uh, we skate to where the puck will be. And last note, I teach at Cornell, Stanford. I, I've taught at NTU in Singapore, at Cal State Saudi, and I teach innovation. I teach a course at Cornell. And quite frankly, I learn more from my students than I, than, than I teach them. Uh, but I keep a little bit up to what's going on through my students and through educating others. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. There's a lot that we're going to be covering, I can tell already. Ibrahim, welcome, and thank you very much for joining. 
Shin, Ron and Kevin and myself today and all the participants here on the program. We already, I see we already have four or five people, who have, uh, five who have joined us. Hi, Stephen, Veronica, Kevin, and uh, all the participants. Thank you for joining. Uh, uh, Stephen was asking us to, t to talk a little bit about our background for those of you who just joined. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur, started my entrepreneurial journey actually out of my college dorm room up in Seattle and um, rolled the proceeds from uh, several exits into what became my family office. And I started to invest very early in climate tech back in 2002, mostly because I was a scuba diver and I saw the degradation and the quality of the marine life firsthand and uh, actually turned my home into Climate University in 2003 and uh, gave, you know, hired every PhD who was willing to take my money to help me understand the kind of the chemical balance on this closed sphere in the middle of space that we were on and where we were headed. And since then I've been uh, building funds and SPVs to put as much money into climate tech as possible in the hopes of accelerating the transition from a high carbon to a low carbon economy. And, um, you know, I, I speak about the subject uh, all over the world and I'm hopefully uh, would inspire some of you to also join us in hastening the transition towards a more sustainable future. Super. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are many areas, many points that we share in common. And one of the things is that we're all dealing with this, our own families as well as other families. So the first thing I'd like to ask is, what are you individually experiencing and seeing of how, Ibrahim, you shared how you became impassioned because of scuba diving. It literally and figuratively opened your eyes to the problems that we're facing today with the environment. And many years ago, people talked about, but they really weren't active. And Kevin, from what you've been doing, and Shin and your, uh, and Veronica, excuse me, and what you've been, and how you've been advising. Would you each now just share with all of us what you're seeing from the next generations of how they're looking to invest, not only financially, but even their time and their passions and how it differs a little bit from what you did. Varan, I'll let you start because you work with some families in Asia. Yeah, um, in Asia, I, I would say that uh, family office is uh, still a rather new concept, um, but we can see that it's, uh, it's increasing at a really fast uh, uh, rate very quick. So um, especially I think from the, for the recent three to five years, uh, we can see that um, the wealthy do not just rely on bankers anymore. Um, they, are, they have the second gen or third gen uh, very much educated and know what they want. So these are the uh, generation that we are dealing with. They are more informed uh, rather than relying on a traditional a portfolio allocation into like bonds and stocks. They are looking at a lot of direct investment and most, more uh, now I see a lot of them targeting at what exactly uh, Kevin and, and uh, uh, Ibrahim is uh, focusing on. Uh, ESG, climate, you know, social responsibilities. In fact, uh, last year um, I have actually worked with uh, this lady um, that that founded Impact as Change, and they have launched a, a what they call a women uh, livelihood bonds. So uh, it was a very successful event, and you can see that uh, green bond, uh, social bond, uh, is becoming something that uh, uh, families are uh, really interested in. Though the you might not be really that attractive, but everyone seems to want to play a part. Yeah. Super. That's what we think, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin, you shared with us that, you know, the words of Gretzky, you skate where the puck's going to be. You're, you've been seasoned to, as I like to say, you've gone to the buffet of life several times and savored <laughs> a lot of what's there. What are you seeing differently now? Because you have a family business. Your children are part of your business right now. 
how are you seeing your children involved, let's say, with your activities, as opposed to some of your contemporaries, and if or if not their children are involved? You know, when I advise others, when I have family involved, I, I tell them a little bit of the experience of, of my, my son, Jared, when he first joined with me. And I say it was about 70% pain and about 30% pleasure. I'll never forget the very first day that he moved up from Miami, having graduated from our alma, alma mater, Cornell. And he said, Dad, you know, I, I want to be at the table when you strike the deals. I don't want to do research, things like that. You know, I said, buddy, <laughs> you know, 2% of your life's at that table. 98% of your life is, is meeting with people, learning what the next trends are, et cetera. I will tell you that as we progressed over time and as we all progressed over time, it became a high level of pleasure and maybe very, very little pain. But at some point, my son really, my oldest son, he, he said, I, I got to go out on my own. I have some ideas for food and beverages. And I was trying to get him involved with techie stuff, okay? We do a lot of clean water work around the world, not just in the U.S. We created the Pure Filter for Procter & Gamble. So I said, okay, what do you want to be involved? He says, there's a new trend called cold brew coffee, and I want to be a pioneer in it. Well, he's now in uh, something like, I think, 25,000 storefronts all across the United States, and he's a national presence in, in cold brew coffee, and I'm so proud of him. And as I say in some other talks that we give, he walked in my footsteps, but he's now got different shoes, and I love it, okay? Now, I'm, I have to give this historical perspective. The, the financial recession that we went through, the great recession we went through, 07, 08, there was a burst of sharing because our young people didn't have any money. So they were sharing cars, they were sharing apartments, they were sharing everything. The sharing economy came out of 07 and 08, no doubt about it, whether it even Facebook, et cetera. This, this economy that we just faced with COVID, the stock market did okay. But what we did is we gained a new reverence and respect for health and science. And so we're spending a lot of time in telehealth now, but to the minorities, to the needy. We just, uh, Steve Harvey's just agreed to be a partner. We want to concentrate on the black community and, and really work on those. So you've got to understand how things change. And we're in gaming. We're in esports because the young people are into gaming and they want to have the individuality of, of winning their own competes, et cetera. So as, as Ron quite appropriately said, they're more knowledgeable. They know what they want more. And you've got to, you know, you got to go with what they want if that's the generation you want to hit. For the elderly, they want to get back to health care because that's the number one priority, especially with COVID. So I'm sorry to be long, but it's there's a trend. You've got you to understand what your demographics are. I always tell people, which category are you going after? Which gen are you going after? They're very, very different in different layers. And Ibrahim, because we've known one another for quite some time, I've had the privilege of witnessing people gravitate towards you, not just because of what you are, but because of who you are. And a lot of people, women and younger men, come to you and seek from both different parts of the world. What have you been seeing in the last few years that is changing how they're looking at having their impact on the world compared to how you approached it? Thanks, Stephen. Um, so what I've noticed is, you know, so a lot of the Gen 2s, Gen 3s now are digital natives, right? So they grew up in the information age. So this notion that they're, you know, like something like the biospheric collapses outside of their understanding is no longer true. So they're facing this very clear understanding and they're, you know, they've been introduced thanks to many people who came before us, this idea that they can use their philanthropic dollars and their investment dollars both towards solving the problem without having to compromise returns. So I think they understand that fundamentally and are starting to push their advisors uh, of all kinds to start moving more capital into, you know, let's call it impact investing the thing, what I'm noticing is there isn't any sort of organization around this space. It's like, it's a, it's this big hodgepodge of do goodness. And you can't do hodgepodge, uh, especially around climate change. It can't be haphazard good because there's things that need to be solved in the first decade 
and there's other things that need to be solved in the seventh decade. But if you don't, if you're, if the goal is just to do good overall, we'll take it. But some of it, um, because it's not prioritized, it might as well not have been done in the first place. Because you have to look at something called, and we have to educate all investors around, this, especially who care about this, something called CROI, Carbon Return on Investment. So that means that you know the per- we have a finite amount of money. And that money has to go towards the highest value molecule abatements uh, and um, the uh, um, scheduled over time. So because unfortunately, warming begets more warming. So again, you know, I haven't said this articulately, articulately, but the what I'm noticing is is the the eagerness to do good, the, the to do good, and a lack of understanding of how of what to do now versus what to do later. And you know, I uh, I've been kind of playing the role of, uh, of because I've been in the space since 2002. I understand literally down to the molecule of where money needs to be deployed. So I've been trying to kind of scream from the rooftops, telling people this is. This is excellent that we're there. Now here's where the money needs to go now versus later. And hopefully that message is getting through. Stephen, can I comment on that? Because I, Please, I agree go ahead. with you 100%, Abraham. But I'm going to add another another tangent to what you just said, if I may. A few years ago, I was the opening keynote at another family office conference. And, and my theme was the following. You know, you have great wealth and you're great generosity. and But... You need to apply the same level of due diligence on those charities that you give to as those entrepreneurs like us that you spend all this time. You beat us up sometimes. We beat up other entrepreneurs. I I could tell you stories about charities, the waste that goes on. And so, Ibrahim, I'm all for the ESG movement. That's the same as the base of the pyramid. My good friend Stu Hart and C.K. Parlett, you probably remember those names. They wrote the fortune to be made at the bottom of the pyramid in the late 1900s. Sounds like a century ago, but it's not that long ago. And they were talking about ESG. ESG is not new. The implementation and the organization of it is still lacking, Abraham, as you just said. But we've got to be self-critical to find out who are really the good guys, not in terms of just spirit, but in efficiency. You know, you're going to give $5 million to an organization, spend five to 10000 and put somebody on a plane and make sure they're doing in the field what they say they're doing. Drilling wells in Africa. I love that one. Okay, I know a lot about water. That's one of my passions. How many wells are still functional? Less than 50%. Do they have a maintenance fund, et cetera? I'm sorry to drag on, but it blows me away. All this do good. It's great do good, but where's the implementation and the effectiveness, and where are we being self-critical to find out who's really doing the job and who's just who's walking and not just talking? So you've all... You've all touched on many points, and there's something that I'd like to address, and it ties into COVID. It's also generational, and it's cultural. Today, we're having this wonderful conversation via Zoom or Teams, whatever the technology is. And Kevin, you talked about getting on a plane. And Ibrahim, you talked about the digital world and speaking. And Varon, you're communicating with your family offices. Are the next generations taking the time from your perspectives and your experiences to build the personal relationships, to leave the the comfort and the sanctuaries of their home and their offices and actually meet people, break bread and go? Or are they too comfortable, too dependent uh, to just say, I'll do it, I'll, I'll Zoom, I'll WhatsApp, I'll Skype, I'll, you know, Instagram and via those channels, I will build my relationships and I'll do my due diligence. I open it up to all of you. So I've, um, I mean, obviously when it came to COVID, we all became glued to the screen, right? So our, you know, our, our life became a series of Zoom back-to-back calls that I literally had to schedule bio breaks around. 
and I think, you know, I mean, it's because, I mean, we literally, it was like one after the other, there was no time to be a human being that required calories in even. Um, so, um, you know, what I've noticed is the conversations just went online. They did, you know, breaking bread became, all, you know, us all eating in front of each other on screen, but it was a party. efficient. I mean, it became extremely efficient, but also was missing something, was missing the warmth of connection, the, uh, the, the, the bonds that happen when we're actually not so efficient, when we're sitting, you know, after a conference, at a lunch, sharing personal parts of ourselves. You know, trust building has definitely deteriorated because there was no human uh the, the humanity part there was no time for it we did it we had 60 minutes to get to the bottom line and i would say that um business wise a lot of transactions happened but not with the level of relationship building that could have happened if we had a mixture of both the efficiency of online and the personal uh connection of being in the same space together. So we'll we'll have to just correct for that, but also still implement some of the efficiencies that have come with these types of uh, communication tools because they have played a role in allowing us to get more done in a day. Yeah, can't agree more. Actually, um, in Asia, um, this COVID has actually brought, um, brought us um, so technologically, uh, uh, so much faster right now, and uh, Zoom call was never uh, something that I I, I would even want to try like uh, more than a year ago. Um, and we believe in relationship building, and we always eating, um, dealing with Asian, dealing with Chinese, especially. It's all about eating you know, and drinking. So we have to uh, get the deal done on the dining table. And then subsequently, maybe over like whiskey or cigars. And these are definitely the things that I, I miss a lot. The face-to-face -face interaction, reading the body languages and uh, seeing whether they, they like or don't like. Because in, for Asia, uh, it's very hard to tell and people don't tell you outright what they want. You have to read all the little gesture and to see whether whether they are they, they are agreeable to something so i think that that is something that become uh becoming really difficult um and especially uh for now uh having a multi-family office in singapore we are seeing a lot of interest coming from north asia uh whether it is taiwan uh, or even china hong kong so so but chinese is um also difficult to deal with them if you just deal over um, Zoom call because a lot of things technologically uh, that Google works in Singapore in all over the world, but it doesn't work in China. So Zoom call works here, but you can never use Zoom. Uh, you have to use a different technology. So, and that they, they will never, they always tell you that, oh, okay, um, we need to see you in order to discuss. So I think this has become a, a, a bit difficult. So what we are trying to do here is, um, we try to create network uh, cross border onshore, um, not just uh, in in China. I think across the whole region, Southeast Asia. So I have to work with uh, same multi family office or office uh, family offices in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, um, Taiwan, and China. So in order to um, have someone uh, that can represent us to deal with. Uh, uh, potential clients or to handle certain deal in certain jurisdiction. I think that's what we are trying to do here, uh, you know, for this, really, I would say it's a post-COVID uh, 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 probably solutions that we are looking at now. COVID is a great excuse. I don't think uh, young people were traveling enough and building relationships before. Uh, mm -hmm. When I teach, I say international business, is three main words, relationships, relationships, and relationships in consumer products is distribution distribution and distribution the way you get that is by in my opinion dealing with family offices around the world politicians don't stick around family offices do families do and i learned that a lot in asia veronica working with some wonderful people that were mentors to me the bottom line is i don't believe young people are doing enough of it you got to go to know okay and they're not doing that and, and I know COVID is a good 
point. I got it, Abraham. But even before COVID, I was complaining to young people that I met, you're too digitized. And you're right, Abraham. <laughs> you know, I spent the weekend in Miami on NFTs. I'm now, uh, you know, I learned it on NFTs and learning, learning fast, fast. You know, if anybody doesn't know, I call them digital trading cards. But you can call them anything you want. I have that all at home. <laughs> right? And, and I'm now learning and we got a couple of business ideas, blah, blah, blah. But the fact of the matter is we got to go to know. And, and we really need to get out there again as the, as the economies open up. We're doing a lot of business in Thailand, of all places, in Brazil. I'm dying to get back there. And you know what? We're still doing the business. That's amazing. But we're not building that relationships the way we need to for long term. And, and that's really the, the, the people you need to know and the families you need to know over the long term. Very, very important. Sorry. No, it's, I agree. And as someone who pre-COVID – was, you know, the journeyman. I was on the road about 200, 220 days a year around the world, basically because I was ignorant and I wanted to understand and meet and know. But I want to bring something back now that has changed, at least in, in my time, a little bit. And I want to know what the three of you think. I'm first-generation American, and my parents came to the States, fulfilled the American dream, and at many meetings, it was my father who was the one present making the decisions. But there were times people would come to our home. And my mother, though, was then also present at those meetings. And she was the size of Edith Piaf. And she had the energy of Joseph Stalin on a westward campaign. My father <laughs> looked and acted like Joseph Stalin on every campaign, east, west, <laughs> north, and south. But it exposed me at a very early age to the power of women. And they both came from continental Europe. So my questions to all of you are, are you seeing today the next gens more women at the table? And not just because they're women, because they're actually being given the skills and the tools to be at the table. As Kevin said, his son wanted to be at the table. He said, first, the fundamentals. What's the uh, Oedipus' answer to the Sphinx? What goes on four in the morning, two at noon and three at night, it's men. We have to evolve. We learn. Are we seeing more families investing in their daughters, their nieces, their wives, maybe, to be at the table, to be the impactful leaders of the future in whatever it's going to be? Um, Not I enough. Go ahead, Abraham, please. So um, in... So I have a, I, I manage a fund called Full Cycle Climate Partners, and a lot of the LPs are actually women. Um, not you know not by far not eighty percent, but probably I'd say closer to sixty percent. You know the uh, some of them are self made, some of them are uh, you know inheritees, etc. But I've noticed that women are leading in this domain of wanting to use investment capital for change so which makes which makes sense to me because my you know they it's a there's a there's a general um culture uh, of uh, uh in women that i've noticed which is taking care of the whole as opposed to having this linear thinking of like what's in it for me which i think uh you know we as men you know stereotype well around and you know I, I appreciate that uh, that viewpoint and that capital direction because we do need to take care of the whole we do live in a closed sphere in the middle of space and if COVID taught us taught us anything is that everything is inextricably connected so there is no specific lane just for healthcare, specific lane for climate for social justice everything is connected and one person coughs halfway across the world, the whole world economy is going to shut down. So it's a, you know, there is no, nothing exists in a vacuum. And that's a, that's a very healthy understanding. And I appreciate women's role in, uh, in that. Now, you know, as Kevin said, you know, we, the, the, uh, what is it? 8.2% of fortune 500 CEOs are women, which is apparently a record. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the previous joke about that was there were more CEOs named John in the Fortune 500 than there were women total. 
And so it's a oh. so we do we do have a long way to go around that. And the thing that we all have to do is we have to uh, start investing in our daughters and our sisters uh, in the in around education, around STEM education, around leadership, around business, because. You know, the, the reason, like I have, you know, Alliance and a lot of technology companies, we're always looking for female engineers and there's, the pool is not that many because 30 years ago, you know, 25 years ago, the culture wasn't pushing, you know, or not even pushing, uh, wasn't um, um, in, inviting more and more women to join and take engineering careers because that's not where we were. So there's this imbalance of the talent pool around STEM leadership and business that now mm -hmm. thankfully is being uh, adjusted and we need to do more of that. So in the next decade or two, we actually have, you know, leadership pools and employment pools that uh, are, th that encompass all the, uh, the talents and education that, you know, such that both genders are equally represented. Can I just make a comment, Veronica? I want to hear what you have to say, but let me say one thing. I say a little controversial stuff because, you know, I, I'm a little older and I can say what I want as long as I'm never. <laughs> one of the problems is women w relating to women. Uh, when you see women leaders, they don't tend to bring up other women up the ranks. Uh, it is definitely an issue that I've seen in some of our organizations. Sometimes women leaders rise, but they're happy to be amongst a lot of men. And they've got to self-cultivate women on women. And I, I'm being critical on purpose because I want to see more because I totally agree. Women bring a perspective to marketing, et cetera. You know, one of my favorites is what's, who's the biggest healthcare system in the world? Mom. Mother. Mom. Okay. So I, I must tell you, Veronica, you'll have more comments about women, et cetera. And I, I, I don't want to be – you got – women have got to be more helpful to each other and less – sort of competitive and worrying about another woman rising up. I always tell entrepreneurs, hire people a lot smarter than you as long as you continue to be the CPO. And no one knows what the CPO is. And I say, chief passion officer. The chief passion officer is not going to get unseated, even if he or she is, the, is not the brightest in the crowd. You need to be bright. Veronica, to you. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I have to agree with you. Uh, I see that a lot. Um, and, and I'm in a industry, a financial industry, tend to be very male dominated. And um, yeah, we see that a lot as you know, women are not helping women and women um, tend to, they feel, I, I don't know, maybe they, they feel that uh, they, are, they, are, they are proud when they are surrounded by uh, a, a male because, it's, 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 because it's, it's such a male dominated industry that one day when you rise up there and you are surrounded by male uh, uh, high-ranking staff, then you you associate that with uh, success. Um, but I think uh, I have to also uh, say that that gap, the gender gap or, or, or male-dominated kind of uh, uh, scenario is actually uh, lesser now. I think we can see that uh, the, the industry is opening up to more um looking at capabilities rather than just gender. Uh, in fact, I just uh, participated in another panel uh, uh, panel talk with uh, uh, women in fintech. So we can see that actually uh, even in Asia, there are quite a lot of uh, female entrepreneurs, uh, even in the fintech industry, which is also very uh, male dominated. So I hope the gap will, will just close up uh, as uh, as everyone evolve, as uh, all, all the mindset change. And uh, I think uh, now women are given uh, equal opportunities, especially in education. Um, for example, in China, we have the one child policy. Um, I see a lot of Chinese family. Now the family office is run, they, they are run by women, run by the daughter. So um, I guess that probably, uh, uh, and we can see also different um probably quality that, that, that female bring into uh, the different investment space. They, they tend to uh, behave slightly differently. Um, female uh, 
usually not afraid to admit that, okay, I'm weak at certain things. I always tell my guys, I say, I'm, I'm like really illiterate when it comes to computer. So uh, I'm, I'm not shy to admit that. But if you ask my husband, he will never say that or never agree to that. So um, I think there are certain uh, 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 strength uh, or certain uh, good point that we have women in, in the organization. It helped to balance out, um, you know, the, the different gender. We, we all have our own uh, pros and cons uh, when it comes to uh, managing an organization. Uh, you have uh, you can actually have both rather than more women or, or, or less male or, or more female than male or more male than female. It doesn't really matter for us. I think eventually everyone uh, will ignore about the gender part. And then now we are talking about, you know, um, even, uh, you know, the gay community or, or, or everything is, is more recognized. And uh, the new generation is, is really uh, neutral. Like you ask my daughter, my kids, uh, and 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 ten, they will be very angry if we make fun of uh, the LB, LGB, you know, the, the 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 gay community or something like that. So I think I think it will change, and I hope that uh, well, uh, this is something that uh, as as the world uh, evolve, you know, this problem will be less obvious. No, it's it. I'm willing to tie in uh, an experience that I had, but also then weave it into the discussion. On February 2020, literally just a few days before the whole COVID lockdown happened in the United States, I was privileged to invest time in Saudi Arabia and the UAE and then in India. And I'm not saying what I saw is representative of all those countries, but what really amazed me when I went into Saudi Arabia I was privileged to meet several women who literally impressed me and blew my mind with what they're doing, what they've studied, technology. And Kevin, they were supporting one another. And I agree with you. I see it often here. Some of the women I know are far more competitive with one another than collaborative. And since COVID, I've kept in contact with several of them. I'm very impressed to see that they are starting to take positions in their family businesses, in technology-driven businesses, or starting up their own. And I'm tying this in because what I'm now seeing as someone who runs his own family offices and office and is, looks for other opportunities, the solutions, the ideas are not coming from Silicon Valley and Silicon Alley. They are today coming from so many different parts of the world. And I think this is a key thing, that the next gens need to be very much more open to exploring that they don't need money or ideas just from this area or these areas, but they need to explore what's in Singapore and Southeast Asia or what's in the Middle East or what's happening in Austria or Hungary because of the impact there. And, and I'm being proactive in it. But my question to you is, are you seeing other families or other next generers saying, let me go somewhere else, even if it's digitally, let me speak to people digitally, to find out what's percolating, or Kevin, your term, is the puck in Riyadh, or is it puck in Reykjavik, or is it puck over in Rajasthan? You know, I, I'd like to comment because I was on that trip with you to Saudi Arabia, and two things, you know, you're right about, a lot more women that was wonderful. But two, what people just don't realize about the Middle East is something like 50% of the population is 30 and under. And Arab Spring is not over. Uh, if we're not satisfying those youths to have opportunities, they're looking up at the, the wealthy and they're saying, you're not giving us enough opportunity, then unrest becomes you know, all sorts of crazy things. So the fact of the matter is, is that we learn from other parts of the world. But I have to tell you one thing, and this is a little, again, controversial. Here I go again. And, and I, I gave a talk about it. You know, with COVID and all of the tragedies that have hit, I, I really, you know, we, we spent a lot of time, my, my family office, on the homeless, uh, the foster children, but particularly clean water. And we've been all over the world, Africa, uh, Latin America, did a lot of work in Mexico, et cetera. And I, I'm all for that. But I will tell you, I look to people and say, Take care of your localities as well. You know, don't just look to other places around the world. 
for instance, I'm right now in New York. We're, we're both Florida and New York and Connecticut. New York City, there's a lot of foster kids and homeless kids in office mm -hmm. in Detroit yeah. and Chicago. And whether it's in Singapore or whether it's in Seattle, you know, look to your local situations, not just those far away situations, because, you know, those families, those fatherless families, those foster kids, I, I have a thing about foster kids now and I've been pushing uh, some of the senators to work on foster kids. I'm, I'm all for the immigration. My dad was an immigrant. I'm an Irish immigrant and proud of it. You know, he did okay. His, all three sons got doctorates. Education, education, education. And I said to a, one particular senator, I love, love the man, he's fabulous. I said, you know, the immigration situation in Mexico, I got it. And, you know, if you feel passionate about it, I respect it. But how about those foster kids in our country? Less than 5% ever go to college. 3% ever get adopted. And, you know, if they're not, after 18, about 30% become homeless within a year. What are we doing about our local people? What are we doing particularly about our local youth? The, the future of this world is not what we as adults necessarily change, but how we help the bottom third to become equal citizens of our earth and not violent unrest and, and really upset with the world as it's presenting itself. One last point. One thing about COVID that we may agree with, we may not, but it's my opinion, certainly, and it's probably, I think it's obvious. The rich have gotten richer and the poor have gotten poor. And we have a responsibility to take care of those who have been set back much further than many of us. Look at our stock markets done well. But look at all that in poverty and those people that no longer have jobs, food, et cetera, and are struggling every day. We have a responsibility to them locally as well as globally. I think we all agree. I want to be sensitive to time. We've got some wonderful, I see, uh, participants uh, listening to us. I'd like to open it up. I'm a few moments tardy. I apologize. Does anyone have any questions for either Varan or for Kevin or for Ibrahim or myself? Please write and ask. We'd love to address them. And I, I don't want to monopolize this because I know we only have a few moments left. And to see. Uh, Go ahead, uh, this, I just opened up. Yes, uh, Kam Hosen, I hope I didn't mispronounce your name. Uh, hi, amazing panel, I just finished another talk I had myself uh, at Borasis, but I joined this panel and what I'm hearing is so refreshing. Um, the issue of water, the issue of women participating in the workforce, what Ibrahim said about uh, climate change that we should look at this as one bubble. This is this is not something that defines national interest. COVID actually helped us to understand that we are on this thing together. There is no Asia, there is no US, there is no Europe, there is just one Earth. So I just wanted to say amazing talk. I hope to have a chance to talk to you guys uh, again because uh, this was so amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to encourage everyone. We've all been to conferences before, and you know we meet, we have the face-to-face, -face and we exchange the cards. But these are different. Please, I'm very privileged. I got, I know Ibrahim, I know Kevin, and I've shared a bit of time with Haram, and we had a great conversation. Do not be bashful. These three people are basically stellar as individuals. And two of them, as I said, are no longer more intimately than the others, they are, and then Varan. But they also bring not just the academic experience in the lecture, they're actually passionate and they're genuine. What you're seeing is what you're, you're getting what you're seeing here. Uh, I'm not here to give them gratuitous compliments. They know me well enough. I'm very honest and very formal and polite. But you really have three people that if I was graph for Harry Winston, I would say I don't have the best gems in the world because three of them are right here with all of you today. So being sensitive to everyone's time, to Varan and to Kevin and to Ibrahim, I personally thank you and I will be in contact. And we've had about 15 or 20 people in and out of today's uh, presentation discussion. I hope that they will reach out to you and continue to learn from you, share with you, and that collectively we'll all be having a stronger impact on the world in our communities, as you said, Kevin, but even as Ibrahim and Barana are doing 
globally, wherever we may be. And I'll leave it to any of you to have any final comments that you'd like to share. Be the change that you wish, the Gandhi expression. I don't have the great, great quote. Don't talk. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you guys a small little uh, business that I just founded as well, uh, besides Envision. Uh, I'm also a founder of a two-wheel electric vehicle company. So uh, it's actually now operating in Thailand. So, uh, okay, participate a little bit in the climate change. Help the world. Thanks, Yeah, man. But still starting up a new startup. Yeah. Yes. Ibrahim. So last, last, uh, last comments. I just, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that this idea of uh, of impact investing is somehow requires concessionary returns is now behind us. So we can expire that. We can file it in history. You know, the biggest 